And we're live now. Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the 62nd meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf and our witnesses will be briefing via Starleaf. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their devices when they aren't speaking. Um, moving on, item number one, apologies, we don't have any. Not that I've been made aware of, Chair. Okay, thank you. Chair, just with respect to apologies, I need to leave at 12 o'clock. I have a training session with the Standards and Privileges Committee. Thank you, Stuart. <coughs> um, item number three then, draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting of the 12th of May at page five of your packs. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on then to item number five, which is our departmental briefing the update on EU UK exit from the EU. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 28 of your pack, a presentation from the department at page 31, um, a clerk's memo from the January briefing on EU exit at page 39, the department's presentation from January um, briefing on EU exit at page 43, the clerk's memo from the concurrent meeting in March with TSS and HMRC at page 49, and a memo from the EU's Affairs Manager on Common Frameworks at page 56. So um, there's a copy of a research paper commissioned by the Finance Committee and the Executive Office Committee on the Protocol at page 66. So I can welcome into the meeting this morning uh, Shane Murphy, who is Head of EU Exit Preparation and Transition Group in DFE, and Alan Ramsey, EU Exit Preparation and Transition Group were we expecting Julia as Julia well? was there, and now okay. she has disappeared, and I'm not sure why. Okay, if I maybe hand over to yourselves first of all, and then if Julia comes back in, I'm um, sure we can add her in as well. Okay, Th thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can, yep. Great. Um, uh, Julia is having some internet issues and is frantically trying to um, get back into the session. Uh, so we, we may have to be patient with, with, with Julia. Uh, it's, it's outside of her control. Um, if the chair and the, and the committee are, are, are content, I'll, I'll not go through the presentation that, that, that we sent in, but I, I wouldn't mind um, uh, touching on, 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 on a few of the top line messages, um, if, if that's okay. Um, some of those top line messages are that the, the, the changes following Brexit are, are probably becoming more observable across the UK and the, the, the EU. Uh, but it is obviously uh, still, still early days and um, there are more things probably to, to pan out. Some areas of business and the economy have been adjusting better than others. And um, I think we still see a range of issues where there's a level of frustration or where there's um, gaps that may, uh, you might call them gaps continue, um, whether that be in buying from, from GB, there's still obviously um, many reports of issues around GB suppliers and, and, and so forth. There's issues and gaps around uh, quotas and uh, safeguarding measures and uh, at risk is still a, a frustration. Uh, as well, and just uh, just to note, uh, Julia has, has 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 joined us. Um, um, many of these sort of things are on the agenda uh, for the for 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 the programme of work between the UK government and the the EU, but there are some important ones as well, which which are actually not part of that. They're they're in the remit of the UK government, such as unfettered access to 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 GB. Um, it is early days in, in the grand scheme of things, um, but there is um, emerging evidence of, in terms of the impact of EU exit and um, the the particular arrangements that 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 fell out of that in Northern Ireland GB and the in the EU. Um, there aren't any official statistics for trade between Northern Ireland and 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 GB um, as as yet. Um, but you know, obviously, there are there's survey evidence there, and uh, that indicates uh, you know some difficulties are certainly been experienced by 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 uh, a range of businesses trading, uh, in particular buying from GB, and I think we'll probably touch on that quite a bit 
today. Um, one of the most common issues we hear about is is how ready G, GB suppliers were for all of this, and obviously there was a lot. Of, there was there was an, a, a big element of an eleventh hour nature of, of of all of this in the in the run up to January. Uh, in terms of north south trade, the the early couple of months of the year indicate um, you know their material increases in, in 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 exports from Northern Ireland to the Republic, uh, and that's a bit of a contrast to the the the, the GB EU trade position and the GB um, ROI uh, trade position. Um, but uh, as a caveat of before, it is important to bear in mind these are early days. Trade figures can be volatile, but um, it probably would come as no surprise to any of you that um, there, there's lots of evidence out there to, to suggest that where you put in trade frictions, that does have consequences for the, 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 the level of trade. And the, I suppose that contrasting experience in the very early part of 2021 would kind of seem to be in tune with that. Um, in terms of some of the issues that are on the go, again, many of these, if not all of them, will be in the slide pack. Um, some businesses and some sectors are are you know, facing some of the more um, so, uh, significant issues with with and challenges with 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 those changes. Uh, you know, some for some that change has been painful. Um, you know, I touched earlier that a, a common a common complaint is around frustration with GB suppliers and 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 how fay they are with the system, and uh, maybe also their their willingness to um, get involved in, in in using the system. Um, administrative bur burden uh, is something that we forecast to 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 come to the fore, particularly as supplementary declarations um, kick, kicked in. In, in, in around February or March, um, and there are particular issues facing manufacturing where they don't have the, the same scope really to use the UK trader scheme um, for their for those goods which are actually inputting into the, the manufacturing process. Um, the issues around access to quotas, TRQs and safeguarding measures also tend to fall more so on the, the, the manufacturing side of things. Um, these are actually quite complex issues, and we know that some of the, these are part of the, the work program of discussions between the, the EU and the, the UK. The, the aluminium one is, is difficult in that you know, there, since the end of the transition period, there's now a disjoint between EU policy and uh, in relation to Chinese aluminium. And the UK has chosen uh, no, not to carry over those uh, safeguarding measures, which puts um, uh, GB uh, businesses uh, 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 who are buying aluminium in a, in, in a different position to, to, to those in Northern Ireland buying uh, aluminium. Um, but there are also things on the horizon as well, which will, 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 will impact um, Obviously, there are the discussions on whether you call it the roadmap or whether you call it the, the work program that the UK and the EU are, 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 are to work on. And obviously, I think we're all keen to see you know, the, the outcome of those two discussions. Um, um, also, worthy of note, it uh, doesn't get as much attention. Um, the UK has delayed the implementation of border controls uh, to, to, for imports to GB. And alongside that, the implementation of phase two of unfettered access uh, um, uh, is also likely to be delayed. That's something I think we're all keen to see the detail on, um, because we're we're we'd like to see that and see it in in good time, so 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 businesses can be either prepared or reassured. You know, this 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 is going to be a big area of interest to to us all in Northern Ireland because obviously GB is is, is such a big market for many of our, our, our businesses. Uh, and in terms of upcoming deadlines, um, again, another deadline that probably doesn't get the attention it deserves is, 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 the, is, the, is the one on um, uh, saddle status and uh, for the end of the end of June. Um, and obviously, we have a, a lot of people in Northern Ireland who, who um, you know, they're 
which we would probably want to see um, uh, have their status um, clarified and sorted out for the for the for the, for the future. And um, so I've just touched on some of the issues. Um, I appreciate time is short today, and obviously in between. Uh, this session and the last session, the, the Minister published the, 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 the TEDx vision last week, and we think that trade and investment will be a big part of achieving that vision in the future. So uh, thank you, uh, and uh, I'll hand back to, to the chairs, and we can take any questions and so forth. Thanks very much, um, Shane. And yeah, I, just, I have a number of questions, and I'll maybe rattle through them as quickly as possible so we can bring in other members too. But Obviously, there's there's still a lot of, um, I guess you could call it, a political background noise in relation to issues around the protocol. And I know David Frost was in front of the NI Affairs Committee yesterday, and you could be forgiven for thinking that his government hadn't negotiated the protocol just a, a few months ago in relation to his commentary around it. But um, <laughs> in relation to the specific issues, I suppose, in relation to the grace periods, and I, I appreciate some of this will be um, Dara's responsibility, but... Um, what's the progress in terms of um, moving those forward to uh, in line with the, the current deadlines in respect of those? Um, and in respect of British businesses and their preparedness or, or lack of preparedness, has that improved over the course of the past number of months as, um, as the new arrangements have be, become more widely known? And then I have a couple of questions. If you maybe want to take those ones first, and then I have a couple of questions, I suppose, about how the new trading arrangements are, are impacting here. So. Oh, oh, okay. Um, in terms of grace periods, um, yes, a, a lot of those are, are, are on, on those that attract probably most attention are, are very much in, in, in the dearer space, albeit it's actually probably the, 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 the deferent space in that, um, obviously, uh, these negotiations are UK EU EU negotiations, and um, um, I think I think um, we 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 got to remember that there, the, these things are not necessarily um, deliverable by um, by Dara, and I, I might bring Julia in here as well. Obviously, there are other grace periods on areas such as um, uh, medical products. Uh, which 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 draw a lot of attention, and while some of those might seem further away, they're 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 no less uh, they're no less uh, pressing. But again, uh, those are they're obviously of significant interest to our, 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 all of us in our, our Department of Health. Or like like the, these are the government lead on um, one which which which. Does have a particular interest for, for us is, is in around the space of of parcels and so forth again, uh, and that's something I'll, I'll, I'll ask Julia to say a few words on if that's possible, Julia. Thanks, um, thanks, Shane. Um, yeah, I suppose on grace periods in general, um, something that concerns us is that it's very clear what that. It's clear what businesses need to do. So, um, in terms of how things are implemented, that it's easy for businesses to do what they need to do, and it's clear their legal position. We can't really comment on the DERA space of things because I know the SBS stuff is is very complex. So, um, I'm reluctant to say, you know, where I'm not over the detail of that. Medicines and parcels, as Shane has mentioned, are two other areas where grace periods are in place for business to business parcels that grace period the UK government has signaled should end in October we would really like to see guidance in to businesses you know as soon as possible if there's any change to what they need to do if the past few months have taught us anything it's that businesses really need time to, to look at what they're required to do and time to implement um, the kind of necessary admin around that so the business to business parcels one is probably the one we're looking forward to um, most quickly. Um, on medicines, I know health lead on that, and there's a lot of ongoing discussions on that one. Again, it's another complex area that um, we need a good resolution on, but in terms of the detail, that would be for health to cover. In, in relation to uh, business preparedness on GB, um, 
this this would be something that we 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 think there's still more work to be done on. Uh, I think I think that would be fair, J Julia. Yeah, um, we know from the kind of HRC um, surveyed businesses, and I forget the exact figures, but nearly every business here has heard of the Trader Support Service and is registered for it if they need it. Whereas in GB, those figures are much, much lower. Um, there simply isn't the awareness that we'd like to see there. Now, there's a lot of different things, G pressures GB businesses are facing in terms of trade with the EU. And, you know, so there are a lot of different things in the mix, but we definitely see there's a need for greater communication to those businesses. And it's something we've tried to do what we can, but it's actually, it's very hard for us to reach GB businesses. And I know businesses tell me they're trying to do what they can and that they're trying to take their suppliers by the hand and, you know, to show them what they need to do. But equally, that's quite labor intensive too. So, um, yeah, there's still a lot to be done there, I think. Okay, no, thanks for that. And obviously, you will be aware that we had the meeting with um, TSS and HMRC to kind of tease out some of the issues and get an understanding of the uptake in the services and, and all of the other issues around that. So uh, that's something that we can, can pick up on as well in respect of it. And then just um, finally from myself, before I do bring other members in, um, in the slides, and it has been uh, reported as well, the, the CSO figures in relation to North-South trade and, and South-North trade and the significant increases there um, as businesses are, are realigning their supply chains. And, and we've seen some of that coming through in surveys from the likes of manufacturing and NI as well. So just wondering um, what's the department doing in respect of supporting businesses to, to uh, realign where where. They, they want to do that. And also you mentioned the 10X plan and there is the Economic Recovery Action Plan as well. Um, and within both of those, there isn't a great focus on any type of economic strategy to um, take advantage of uh, the potential opportunities under the protocol and the ability to sell into both the EU and British markets. So just in terms of the, the work that's being undertaken in, in the department and with a, agencies like Invest NI and Intertrade, in respect of that, if you could maybe give us a bit of an outline. Okay, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the second of those first. Um, um, yes, uh, uh, 10X, um, uh, there's a big focus on uh, in, in innovation within it. Um, but I think all of us within the department will, will recognize that uh, the, 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 the benefits of Innovation um, require those, uh, that innovation to be commercialised, and then for the uh, commercial benefits of that to be to be scaled up. In a market the size of Northern Ireland, um, we're unlikely to um, enjoy the full benefits or the full potential of innovation without a lot of export activity of that innovation. And that's where um, the, the, the the trade and export side comes in. And um, uh, the, the stronger offer that we have in exports, the more ability that we will have to scale up the benefits of that, uh, that innovation uh, and, and, and use that as a means to, to trade around, um, um, whether it's GB, the EU and around the world, because that, that's where we really can multiply up the benefits of that innovation because we're, we're, we're probably never going to um, make the most of that innovation if, if, if all we ever do is sell 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 the products sell the innovation within a market the, the, the size of Northern Ireland and obviously um, 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 all the advantages that we have on um, on, on, on trade will, will be useful in that in addition another element that, that we see, and I, I'm not sure if, if, if many have picked this up in, in, in the latest um, um, release from NISRA of the Broad Economy and Sales and Exports uh, Survey. But exports is, 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 is um, actually something which is, is, is well distributed across Northern Ireland. Obviously, uh, at, at, at different times, there are 
there's, there is a, a, a focus on the extent to which economic activity is can be sent, uh, you know, uh, centered in and around the Belfast area. Well, exports is is one thing which you know isn't nearly so centered on 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 the Belfast area, and so um, um, multiplying up those benefits uh, for, for, from exporting um, is also a good way of distributing the benefits across Northern Ireland. So we, we do see a big role uh, in uh, trade and investment playing in, in, in making not just 10x happen, but actually happening at a scale that, the, 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 that there is there within the uh, ambition in 10x. It's something we, we would hope to say more about. In, in, in the coming weeks and months uh, as to how we would take those sort of themes and sentiments of 10x and, uh, and, and, and adopt them into some sort of uh, trade and investment, whether it's strategy or plan. Uh, in terms of your, your, your first question on, um, on, 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 on exports to the Republic of Ireland and, and, and trade, um, yes, uh, I, I, you know, we're, First of all, I th- I got I got to say the caveat again that uh, um, trade figures are volatile, can be volatile, and there's only a couple of months trade figures here. Uh, but that 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 that's that said, there are sort of contrasting. Um, that first few months of the year has been contrasting, for example, between the. Um, Northern Ireland or OI experience and the GB EU experience or the GB um, or or OI experience and um so you know, um they're, 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 that may well pan out and certainly um all the literature would expect us uh, expect a situation where frictions emerge that there are consequences um for 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 for, for trade i don't know if julia wants to say any more on that first first subject yeah i was just going to say that intertrade um as you know sort of have very strong program of work in terms of encouraging or facilitating north-south trade um that the supply chain issues is something that has increased the interest maybe in that um but i'll also say it's it's in speaking to businesses it's it's you're right that a lot of businesses are trying to think can i get this product elsewhere you know if the admin burden of sourcing this from jeep from gb or wherever they get it is increased um Sometimes they genuinely can't. Sometimes there's no supplier on the island of Ireland. Or so, you know, it's um, for some products it may be relatively easy to switch. For other products, there's a little bit more involved. Whether it's um, kind of um, <laughs> regulatory standards that your suppliers might have had to go through that mean you're you can't easily just move to somebody else. Or again, that question of what well, there, there mightn't be another supplier that's within easy, easy reach. So there's um, there's definitely increased interest in that north-south area and in kind of supply chains generally in terms of looking at your supply chain and ensuring you're sourcing kind of the goods at the the best price you can. But there are also real ongoing difficulties around areas where supply chains cannot be re-engineered or um, so quickly. Um, so that's sorry, it's a little bit complex, I suppose. No, thanks for that. And um, just, I suppose, to pick up on that final point, is that something that is being supported through the Invest or, or, or even through TSS? Or, or what mechanisms are there there to support businesses who are having difficulties with supply chain issues that you know can easily be reorientated? Um, yeah, so there are um, support from Intertrade that in, Invest and I um, have a range of supply chain supports as well. It's it, once you get to kind of supply chain issues, it becomes very um, particular to the particular components you're talking about. So um, it, it's it's hard to generalize, I suppose. But yeah, that is an issue that ourselves invest in trade. We're all sort of looking at to see what, well, what are the issues? What can be done? Yeah. I suppose looking at the big picture where you see increased costs to businesses, you worry about our long term competitiveness if those costs remain stable. Um, I don't know, Shane. Did you want to say any more? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think uh, as Julia talked about there, in, in some in some cases, um, it does appear that supply chain issues are more solvable 
where there are more alternatives. Um, but I think you'll have heard me make the point before that the interaction between the withdrawal agreement and the TCA had a particular outcome for uh, distribution businesses. Um, quite a lot of distribution businesses uh, um, had distribution hubs in GB, which often served GB in Ireland. And um, those, I suppose, were the hubs that the, 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 the companies or the wholesalers in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland would have rang for their supplies. Um, but the combination of uh, the way Brexit occurred and the TCA has made that a, a, a lot more complicated in terms of uh, um, shipping components from around continental Europe to a distribution hub in, in somewhere in the centre of England before moving all those products out. That has now become a lot more complicated and it may be that those distribution hubs have to change and move in the future and whatever we do in Northern Ireland, I suppose uh, we will be at the end of that, not in, in the middle of making it happen. And so it, it will take a while to pan out. And um, we, we'll do already hear of some distributors moving um, moving to, to, to look at uh, having dual um, supply routes. Um, but they, 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 there are quite quite big issues here and a lot of them are upstream of Northern Ireland and not necessarily within the control of Northern Ireland companies. Oh, thanks for that. Um, can I bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, and good morning and thank you for your briefing this morning. Um, uh, probably a couple of things that I would just like to reflect on that have already been raised, um, but if we could kind of tease them out a little bit more. Shane, we talked, uh, the Chair uh, questioned you in relation to um, how is the Department preparing for um, as, uh, assessing the opportunities that we would have here as a result of the protocol. And, and, and certainly I would um, also feel that the um, strategies that are currently um, been launched by the department don't really reflect um, the opportunities that may be available. And I'm, I'm quite uh, aware that, you know, a recent uh, quarterly, quarterly review of the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, they report that 68% of businesses believe that Northern Ireland's status post EU exit presents growth areas for their region and 47% of the business uh, believe that it will represent growth for their particular businesses. I think it's really incumbent upon the department to um, maximise as much research and opportunity that, that they can present and help support businesses to realise that opportunity. And I just feel that that is missing, but I do believe that your department has a key role to play in that. Uh, and I appreciate your saying, you know, the innovation uh, needs to be commercialised and therefore um, that, that, you know, drives, that will be the export companies that will be doing that as well. So can, can you maybe speak a little bit more on that um, particular chain? Yes, yes, I, I, I'll, I'll start off on, on, on that. Um, uh, what, what I was saying was that the 10X is very much um, focused on the innovation element as the, as, as the driver of growth. Um, and, and what is implied, but probably not, uh, it's probably not uh, sort of spat out in 10 acts is, is, is for the great work on innovation in order to maximize the potential of that, it, 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 it needs trade because Northern Ireland is just, just too small to maximize the potential of that. Um, and so we, we um, would aim to put out um, uh, a, a, a piece of work which will illustrate how, how we aim to do that and how we'll, re, how we'll set our priorities going forward to do that. And I might bring Alan in here in, in, in a minute regarding this. And uh, trade and investment is going to be crucial um, because if we, if we end up just being very innovative, but only been innovative within Northern Ireland, we will never prosper. We will never maximize the potential of that. And so uh, trade and investment is, is the means to multiply up the benefits 
of that initial of a focus on, on, on innovation. And as I said as well, um, um, unlike other economic indicators, exports is an indicator which is well distributed across Northern Ireland. And I know there's many in society and the committee would mm -hmm. like to see um, a focus on distributing benefits across Northern Ireland. And actually exporting appears to be one way of, of doing that. I think I've said at the committee before, maybe once, maybe twice, um, we have a piece of research um, um, in, in, in the pipeline, which uh, is looking at our, our economic strengths and weaknesses and opportunities going, going forward. The, it's, it's going to look at the, the situation for foreign direct investment across the world the areas of the world that we compete with. And I suppose, ultimately, um, what sort of sectors should we be competing for, given our, 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 our strengths and offers? Um, who are we competing against? And I suppose, which countries and which sectors we should be putting uh, client executives in, on a, a sort of it, from invest and I on the plane to? And so that, that, that is something on the pipeline, and that is something that will um, influence and 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 drive a, a, a big part of that. Well, whether there's a trade and investment action plan or whether there's a trade and investment strategy, and I'll bring Alan in, in in a minute. Um, um, there's probably also going to be questions about um, a foreign direct investment and ten x, uh, and um, whether we, we become more selective uh, on that front. Uh, if, we're going to focus on some things in 10x and not try and be good at everything in the world, but really focus on those things we can be world class on. There's also questions as to uh, that if we're, if, go, if we're going to be focused on everything we do, are we going to be focused in that area as well? Alan, is there anything you want to row in on there? Um, Shane, no, that's that's pretty good coverage. I think the key points there are about you know how we use trade and investment, particularly trade and exports to, you know, as Shane describes it, to, to multiply up the benefits um, that we would hope to gain through 10 times and innovation, um, and that those are distributed quite equally across Northern Ireland. So I don't want to go back over that, Sinead, but I do want to give you some comfort that we certainly are thinking about those issues. Um, and we're, we're starting to flesh out, you know, what what that strategy is going to look like. Um, you know, initially sort of agreeing our principles and priorities for trade and investment, um, and making sure that those are well locked in with with the ten times strategy. Um, so, not not too much more detail than Shane, but um, I hope I can give you some comfort. And um, we we'll certainly come back um, as we develop that over the next few weeks and, and share more information. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Alan. Uh, and I look forward to the research document because I, I think it will uh, influence how we think as well. Just to, maybe for a little bit of insight, I had a meeting, my team had a meeting with uh, TSS UK uh, regarding um, some areas where um, some of our constituents were, were having problems. And there just appears to be a real problem with distributors. Um, uh, and not necessarily that there are any blockages, but they have chosen uh, not to carry goods uh, and, and no particular reason because there are no barriers and um, access is, is open for them. For example, I had meetings with uh, podiatrists and they um, were their suppliers couldn't carry, couldn't get distributed blades uh, and cotton wool because of the particular codes. Now there is no barriers in trade for any of those um, uh, articles at the moment, uh, yet distributors are, are refusing to carry them. Now they're working on a, a TSS for, from um, the supply side and that on behalf of um, uh, on behalf of the companies, but there seems to be a real issue with GB. Uh, companies in, in relation, they've just chosen not to supply or not to deliver, as opposed to being actually blocked. And I, I you know, what what can the department uh, do in those circumstances? Uh, um, um, obviously, I raised distributors earlier on. It's 
it, it's not something that's got a lot of focus. I think I also raised distributors at, at the previous session uh, uh, that uh, th that we had with the committee. And, uh, I, I, you know, if I'm being honest, the, there's a real adjustment coming to, to distribution networks. As I've tried to illustrate, and you know, maybe this is something that we could say a bit more on, uh, but uh, the historic distribution networks uh, um, you know, broadly lead to, uh, you know, it's not in every case, but in a lot of cases, there are distribution networks in GB where a lot of goods from around the world, including from a lot of places in Europe, uh, arrive in, and then they arrive in at a sort of, of a, 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 a regional hub, and the word regional there is, is, is for a region of Europe, um, and then those goods are moved around to, to, to local distribution hubs. And the, those sorts of, those sorts of um, systems have been in place for years. They've grown up over years, and they were efficient to do it in, in, in that way. But the interaction with the, with the, the, the withdrawal agreement and the TCA have introduced uh, a lot of new complications for those. Uh, I'm sure uh, many of the members will have heard the Percy Pig story, where um, Marks and Spencer's per Percy Pigs come in from from, uh, from from Germany into some sort of distribution centre for Marks and Spencer's in, 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 in England, and then for them to go to um, uh, stores in the Republic of Ireland, they hit a, a rule, rules of origin issue, and they're not... Um, um, uh, not tariff free because there's been no further processing of, of any note done done in England. Uh, so so this is all extra complications, and um, as a result, um, you know, it isn't the same for distribution as before. It's really rather different for distribution, and it's entirely plausible that distribution networks upstream of us. You no, know, uh, uh, that are that are sitting in 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 in, in, in the centre of GB, um, will, may have to change or may have to be duplicated. Um, so uh, the, the, these are complicated things. They are upstream of us. We are at the end of them, not 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 in the middle of them. So um, I, I suppose I'm, I'm go back to this point, but I suspect some of those frustrations will will. Link back in some cases to distributors who are wondering whether it is uh, the new era is worth the hassle for them, and whether they need to set up something different. I don't know if Julia wants to say anything more about that, but uh, distributors is is, is, is a, you know is a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention, but for me is is is, is rather important. Yeah, I suppose I'd just add that. Um... We see the difficulties from our end, but I know from kind of white all meetings you, or you know more general business meetings you sit in on that distribution and wholesaling in GB has had serious issues in terms of um, the TCA and you know GB was a big distributor for the whole of the EU, and the difficulties we've seen are mirrored really in terms of elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so as Shane said, it's. It is a, it's a big issue. Um, it, there's definitely probably change coming. Um, it's hard to predict, you know, how individual distributors will react to that. As Shane said, some probably downsize their business. Some probably um, open warehouses elsewhere, depending on where their customer base is. But um, it's yeah, I, I, it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's definitely an issue, and it's one that's working its way through. Now, um, it's very difficult to know what government should or, or could do about it at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Jared. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this has been a useful briefing for us. Um, one of the things, that I, I, and you're, you're right, there, there's a lot of politics in this, but there are also the practical outworkings of, of, of where we're at. Um, has anybody sat down and segregated out what might be described the GB EU issues from the GB EU NI issues? Um, because I think we, we often lose sight of the fact that 
a lot of the problems that we're facing in Northern Ireland are identical, whether you're in England, Scotland or Wales, um, in relation to imports from the EU, uh, and then you have the, the, the knock-on problems for Northern Ireland. It might be useful just if the department or someone could set out in simple form those issues that are barriers to trade, nothing to do with Northern Ireland, but only and solely to do with the United Kingdom government's uh, Brexit arrangements with the EU. Second area of, uh, that I would like to ask you about is in relation to the trader support scheme, and, and we've heard this this discussed before, uh, and it's excellent that Northern Ireland has picked up uh, widely in relation to the trader support scheme and. and, and you know, good on the department for identifying that it's there and all of the, the, the things that it's that it's achievable for, for businesses. The, con the area of concern is that, that it hasn't been picked up by, by traders across the UK, but is there not a similar scheme in the rest of the UK for those who wish to trade with the EU? Is there not a, tra a, a trusted trader scheme or, or, or trading scheme initiatives for, for businesses? Surely businesses that trade into France and Germany and Italy and Spain ha face many of the barriers that we are facing here in Northern Ireland. And could it not simply be that when advise, when they're taking up that advice, and I can't imagine that they wouldn't be taking up that advice, that somebody just simply tags on a little line and you know there's a similar scheme for Northern Ireland? Uh, finally, it, it, it struck me around the whole issue of the when somebody mentioned Percy Pig. Um, one of the possible solutions, and it's actually been pushed very hard in relation to medicines, and I, I, I appreciate we're not the Department of Health here today, um, and in fact, one of the solutions that, is, that has been used uh, when we were in the, EU, uh, in the EU and now since we left the EU is quite simply when goods are manufactured in the EU or they're manufactured in the United Kingdom and they're manufactured to uh, the absolute same and identical standards, but they nevertheless have to stop midstream. The solution that many uh, drug companies have come up with and, and it has been accepted by government is that when an item comes into the United Kingdom, you simply switch the barcode off. And then when it leaves the United Kingdom to go to the Republic of Ireland, and this is where it's been tested, when the item, and lots of medicines come from the EU, because that's where they're manufactured, they go to distribution bases in the UK, but they're actually consumed by the health uh, by patients on the health service in the Republic of Ireland. And there's a very simple methodology to doing it. You switch the barcode off. So it can't be used in the UK. And you switch the barcode on when it arrives in uh, the Republic of Ireland for use. Why on earth can a simple solution like that not be used for so many products across the EU uh, uh, and, uh, and for, for, for trading uh, between the EU GB and Northern Ireland? Okay, uh, I think there's three questions there, and I, I might get uh, Julia to, to, to think about the the, the last one. Um, uh, obviously, medicines is is is, is something which uh, DOH lead on, yeah, yeah, but and they will know the detail on that more so than It's only an example of a solution. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Okay, the first of those questions, uh, I, I think there's a sentiment there of trying to understand um, um, which outworking drives which, which which types of consequences, um, yes. and I think we, we that is something that that can be done. But some of the things that we that, that we are talking about here, um, uh, um, and particularly around distribution and so forth, w we would see that as the interaction between the trade and cooperation agreement and the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, both 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 things being at play in, in, in that. Um, uh, so I'm not sure it will always be able to, to, to separate out the issues and pin them down to one single source. Um, you know, Brexit, uh, I think, was always expected to be complicated, and it certainly ended up complicated. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't be certain that we can trace lots of issues back to, to a single source. Secondly, in terms of uh, TSS, unless Julia uh, uh, can put me right, uh, there is not an equivalent 
of TSS, uh, or certainly not as yet, for for for, for GB businesses um, selling into um, the, the 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 EU. Uh, so there isn't a, 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 an equivalent. Um, that said, you know, there there are there are are general schemes such as um, you know, their trusted trader type schemes, which uh, allow you to to um, uh, um, have certain privileges uh, compared to the norms when when undertaking trade activity. Um, but that that is that's 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 nothing, or that is not uh, the same as a as a, as a TSS scheme. Mm -hmm. Julia, do you want to say any, any more than that, or, and then on to the the, the 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 third point around the the medicines as an example of ways of overcoming issues? Um, Shane has just tried on TSS, and I'd add to that probably the movement assistance scheme for SBS goods. You know, um, it's surprising sometimes the businesses that haven't heard of the supports that are available in GB. You know, businesses of some size. Um, and it, there's clearly a communications gap, and, and it's it has proven to be a difficult one. Well, for us in particular. On your point around medicines, um, the system I think you're describing is from the falsified medicines directive. Mm. Um, we see. So I see your point in terms of you know you know where the goods have ended up, and you see similar systems, I suppose, for excise goods. Um, yeah. That's generally coding, where we see. Coding. So, I mean, the electronics are all there. It's just a matter of getting the appropriate uh, secure systems in place. Yeah, I think um, from memory, Simple. some of these were sort of raised as part of the alternative arrangements um, a group of things that have been looked at. From memory, um, it's very difficult to apply these to all goods, whereas it, Systems are in place to deal, to deal with some goods that are controlled for various reasons. But you know, name, name, me for a good, that name me a good that hasn't got uh, some sort of barcoding or, or tracking coding on it today. Um, hmm. I don't know a piece of aluminium, <laughs> but um, I, I, yeah, I, I think I, I think the, the point that Julie is getting across is that medicines are a regulated environment. Medicines have a particular supply chain that when they enter a country, they will enter the health system, they will end up being prescribed mm. to, to a person. So the end use of them, there's comfort that there's regulation over the end use. A packet of cigarettes may have a barcode, but there isn't the same regulation as to where that packet of cigarettes ends up. Is that, is, is that part of the point, Julia? No, but you just add think, a, but you just add a little more information to the barcode, and you can have everything from origin to the to the name of the person who made it, embedded in it. it it's simple. Um, that may be. I suppose it's beyond. Um, if if that was to be introduced, it would be a custom solution. I suppose it is. Um, yeah, um, and would be with HMRC probably to implement. Mm. Um. Is such a system probably? You, I don't. You know that switching out of barcodes probably would need to be introduced on a wider scale than just Northern Ireland. I'll, I'll um, not charge. I'll not charge you for the idea. You're okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 th I think we understand the idea and the concept. I think my my cigarettes example is is probably one where um, some within any negotiation of this and this would. Be a UK EU negotiation, um, and uh, there, I, I would not be surprised if the EU had some thoughts as to the risk to the single market um, and the risk for, for 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 goods to be moved potentially illegally when there isn't the same sort of control around them. Um, so uh, I'm I'm you know, I suppose we're not saying that there isn't merit. In in, 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 in in such an idea and such an approach, um, but um, an idea just having merit doesn't necessarily mean it yeah. would meet the threshold of yeah. the negotiating stances of either the EU or the UK government. Yeah. And, and it doesn't and it, it doesn't remove the requirement to, to to sample, for example, at the port of Larne, but it adds an extra line of surety to the whole process, and it probably allows larger quantities to be uh, shipped rather than, than having to be stopped and checked. 
It's part of the armory or way of doing it. Ultimately, uh, it, 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 it may be, and by the sound of it, these, um, these concepts are, uh, sh should be known about uh, within UK government and EU circles, and ultimately it is whether uh, those circles pick up those ideas and run with them, make them work, and make them work in a, in a way which is acceptable to both parties. I was trying to take the politics out of it and get some down, down to some of the practicalities. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, John O'Dowd, can we bring John into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Firstly, can, can I ask the question in relation to distribution centres? And uh, understandably, there's been quite a bit of discussion around the distribution, and that's going to be an increasing issue if certain issues aren't resolved or changes in supply networks are not enacted. Uh, in terms of distribution centres in Britain, uh, and perhaps, uh, I don't want to put words in people's mouths, but there's a suggestion that some of those may need moved. Can they be moved to here? And what potential is there in terms of economic growth if such distribution centres are moved to here? OK. Um, well, uh, obviously, uh, there, there would be choices for the owners of those uh, distribution centres to move to the location that 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 best best suits their their um, their, their their situation, and uh, yes, there may be opportunities uh, in relation to, um, uh, for example, um, a location of Northern Ireland might be the one place where the old model of distribution might still work. But on the other hand, of course, Northern Ireland, is, is, you know, it, as, as remoteness within Europe goes, it's, 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 it's at the edge. And obviously, uh, cost and distribution um, are, 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 are a factor. And I, I, I don't, personally, I, I don't know what the conclusion for that sort of trade-off would be for, for, for a distri distributor sitting in, 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 in England, for example, whether a, a move to a location which might get over some of the um, um, uh, distribution issues would come, as a, come as a consequence of being somewhat more remote. Yeah, uh, of course, each business will have to make their own calculations, but it would appear it's a choice between being able to distribute into Europe or not being able to distribute into Europe. Well, depending on the scale of your operation, uh, I, I would imagine that a number of businesses, or not many businesses, will have to come to that or have to uh, do that equation. The other point I want to raise with you, and she yes. you mentioned this, the deadline for the end, the, the deadline for the settled scheme, uh, EU, EU, EU settlement scheme, is next month, uh, and I, I'm sure others are deeply concerned about this because we now face the prospect of EU workers, our neighbours, uh, our, our children's classmates and families being denied EU settlement uh, and if they haven't applied or there's problems with their um, application that some of those people may be asked to leave um, how many have you any estimate in terms of how many of our, our neighbors and fellow workers this impacts on um, and what else can be done to ensure that as many people as possible are applying for that scheme and what assistance is being given to businesses in regards to the extra costs around that scheme Okay, uh, in relation to the, the latter point of assistance, I may have to defer to Julia on that one. In, in terms of the, the deadline for applications to the EU settlement scheme is the 31st of June. As we understand that the latest um, figures that are published by the Home Office suggest that something in the order of 88,600 Northern Ireland-based applications to the scheme were made by the, 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 the end of April. Um, and that was up by a couple of thousand or so on the on, on, on the previous months. Um, but there, there is no doubt that there is a risk 
that that won't cover everyone, that there won't be some people who either didn't get around to it or didn't know about it or, 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 or didn't think it was all that important. And um, this, this is something that TEO have been uh, leading on and have been putting in place. And you've probably seen some of the communications. And um, further communications activity has been planned over the oh, 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 over the weeks, the next few weeks until the 30th of June, to try and maximise awareness and try and maximise, um, as you say, our our, our, our neighbours. And 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 seeking to um, you know their put their 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 status in the country and on a more sure footing going forward. Julia, is there anything in particular that has uh, occurred via business on on this? Um, well, we we have done a good lot of business communication to business you know to sectors that are likely to employ a lot of um, EEA migrants. Um, so. That has been ongoing for a good while. Um, I know from from well talking to various people that what they tell you is is that one of the big issues is um, reach reaching the hard to reach people. So people who you know aren't particularly you know okay with kind of doing things online or and that population is a real worry. I think um, we won't know probably whether this is a problem on, or how big the problem is until a little bit later on. And one of the issues there is that there's been a bit of change in terms of population with COVID restrictions and kind of furloughing of people and people returning perhaps to, um, to, to be with family during kind of lockdowns. So when the population figures are... Um, are difficult at present, and that makes it difficult to know whether there's a big problem here. Um, I don't know whether Alan has anything I've missed or. Yeah, just um, in terms of John's concern about you know those EA EA citizens who may miss the deadline. I suppose I'm aware, John, that um, DWP is working with um, Treasury and HMRC on. <laughs> the details of a, of a program for post 30th of, of June um, in terms of, you know, the vulnerable EEA citizens and those who, who've missed the deadline. Unfortunately, um, as Shane said, it's TO lead on this, but so I'm, I'm not entirely clear what the details of that are, but, um, you know, they are thinking about the, the post grace period um, arrangement as well. Now, obviously that will be, I imagine, short term. Um, and obviously, the focus should still be on readiness and getting those, you know, hopefully final applicants through the system. But, but surely there's an onus on the Department of the Economy uh, to support local businesses in terms of ensuring, because uh, as Julie has said, there those who will be less au fait uh, with the system or with online or the need to do this will be those workers in the agri-food industry will be those workers in manufacturing uh, who, I know in terms of my own constituency, many of our agri-food businesses rely on EA workers and, and workers from other states as well. So uh, I, I have, have, my experience of the Home Office and DWP is how you put workers out, not how you bring workers in. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's an onus on the Department of Economy to support our local businesses on it, indeed those uh, EU workers who have uh, kept our economy running over many years. So I, I would encourage the department to carry out a role in that as well. Um, as Julia said, we, 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 we have been uh, endeavouring to, to, to target areas where um, um, employment of, of migrant workers is, 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 is well known or is clustered. Um, and obviously, businesses uh, ha have an incentive to, to 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 hang on to their staff. Um, there are, um, are some of our businesses, as you say, who who, who particularly rely on 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 migrant workers, and and, and people who are here, uh, and, and and they they have the interest in, in getting their 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 their, their staff. Status, um, um, re regularise going forward. I think that's something we could we we could take away and think about um, whether 
there there is more potential in, in that from the employer side. Obviously, ultimately, these are um, um, uh, requirements that will have to be exercised by 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 the individuals themselves. Just finally, Shane, and I know you don't mean any offence by the term migrant worker, and that's not your intention, but I don't like the term. I have to say I do not like the term migrant worker. Up until six months ago, these people were, or in fact, I'm still an EU citizen, so they're, they're fellow EU citizens who have been working, living beside us, contributing to our economy uh, for many for a number of decades now. So, and, and I, have, I understand you don't mean any offence. It's a term that is used, but I honestly don't like it. Uh, and uh, I, and I understand that, and yeah. uh, it's 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 it's, it's uh, I think it's a, it's a term that's 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 commonplace in, in this space, but it's 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 one which uh, I think not everyone is comfortable with, and appreciate that. Thanks, John. Um, can I just ask you a question following on from that in relation to frontier workers? It's one that we we know there's a wee bit less awareness of. Um, and just wondering, is there any work that the department's doing along with TEO or Intertrade Ireland um, in terms of kind of publicising that one a bit more? I, I think that there isn't the same deadline. I think you can still apply beyond the 1st of July, but if you're here, you're supposed to have the, um, you're supposed to have applied by the 1st of July. Um, frontier workers, um, unless Alan knows the detail on that, that might have to be something we, 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 we come back to you on. Alan, anything in particular in frontier workers? Um, Presumably well, this would be uh, frontier workers where um, um, folks coming from 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 from, from, uh, there, from, from down south who would who, who would not be um, a crossing on the basis of um, CTA, CTA rights. That, that might have to be something we, 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 we come back on. Yeah, no, happy to do so. I, I just don't have the detail to hand right now, Chair. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I haven't got anybody else indicating that they want to come in, so thanks for your briefing. Um, there's a few wee things that we'll follow up on as well, so thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, folks, we... Or do you want to agree the actions first? Yeah, sure, if we can just get agreement um, to write to TEO about what plans they have for those who miss out on the deadline for settled status. Um, officials were saying it, it's a TEO lead legally. Um, so it's, it's a case of writing to them to see what measures they have in place, what they're going to be doing um, for support for um, or to reach more vulnerable groups and so on either before the deadline or once the deadline has happened. Also, there's two um, points to put to the department on that. That same point as to what they're going to do, and also um, the issue that's just been raised by Frontier Workers. So if members are in agreement, we follow up on those. Yep. Okay. Okay, thanks, um, Peter. We're moving on then to item number 12 in your packs. It's the briefing on parental bereavement leave and pay bill. Um, it's a pre-introductory briefing. There is a clerk's memo at page 110 of table papers, the copy of the um, bill itself at page 116 of table papers, and the explanatory and financial memorandum at page 146 of table papers. Then there is a departmental response in the bill consultation at page 157 and the Hansard of February's briefing from the department on the bill at page 184. So, Tommy, you have the witnesses in the spotlight already. Thank you. Can I welcome to the meeting Colin Jack and Kelly Sprott and Lawrence Rogers. And if I hand over to yourselves to, to give us a, a background briefing and then we'll open it up to members. Okay. Um... Thank you, Chair, for inviting us here today to provide the committee with details of the parental bereavement leave and pay bill, uh, which has been drafted since the last time that we appeared before the committee in February, when we briefed members on the departmental response to the consultation exercise. Um, I believe that copies of the bill and the explanatory memorandum have been made available to you. Um, the Minister intends to introduce the bill to the Assembly uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and that date is dependent on the Speaker uh, being able to carry out all of his required checks and the receipt of formal uh, consent from the Secretary of State. 
Uh, but in summary, the bill will allow for the introduction of legislation uh, that will provide for a statutory entitlement to two weeks bereavement leave and pay for employees who suffer the loss of a child uh, and two weeks bereavement pay for workers who suffer the loss of a child. Um, and this new statutory entitlement will also be provided to those parents who suffer a stillbirth. Um, it is a relatively small single issue bill uh, and so uh, it can be accommodated uh, in what is really quite a narrow wa window of opportunity for legislative change in the current uh, Assembly mandate. Um, the bill contains powers to allow for regulations related to employment protections uh, whilst on uh, parental bereavement leave. Uh, this mirrors similar regulations associated with other forms of family related leave such as maternity and paternity leave um, and in that regard it's akin to the uh, Parental Bereavement Leave and Pay Act in Great Britain, uh, which was given the Royal Assembly in 2018 and operational last year. Um, the bill contains a transitional power that will enable working parents who lose a child in 12 months prior to the legislation becoming operational, um, and that really uh, means from uh, a date last month, uh, all being well, uh, to avail of the new employment right. That's one element of the bill that diverges from the GB entitlement, uh, which didn't, uh, the, the GB bill didn't include a transitional provision. So I'll start by giving a, a quick description of the bill and the various clauses. So clause one uh, amends part nine of the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 uh, by inserting a new chapter, um, which will result in the provision of an entitlement to parental bereavement leave. Um, the changes to the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 set the terms in which a parent will become entitled to the leave component. Um, they also define the minimum period of leave that must be legislated for. Um, that period will be set at two weeks. Um, the changes to the order also set the time frame within which the leave must be taken, which will be uh, 56 weeks after the child's death. Um, the committee um, should note that while the text of the bill says at least 56 days, uh, it is our intention to set the time period at 56 weeks uh, following the, the death of a child. Um, the order will also be amended to confirm that an, an employee's terms and conditions and their obligations will not be affected by taking the leave. Um, the insertion made by Clause 1 uh, will also allow for regulations to be made that cover special provisions such as matters related to redundancy and alternative employment and the consequences of failing to comply with those regulations. Clause 1 also covers the insertions necessary to allow for regulations to set the administrative standards and procedures that employers and employees have to follow if they're claiming and processing this period of leave and the consequences of not complying. Um, from a technical approach, it also sets out how regulations can modify the way in which a week's pay is calculated to take parental bereavement leave into account. Um, the clause will also create the power for regulations to be made that expand the rights to those parents who suffer a stillbirth, uh, and that's recognised in law as uh, happening after 24 full weeks of pregnancy. Um, clause 2 of the bill adds um, part 12ZD uh, to the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Northern Ireland Act 1992 to create an entitlement to parental bereavement pay. Um, similarly to how the changes are proposed in the um, Employment Rights Order 1996 to give entitlement to the leave aspect of the entitlement, the changes in Clause 2 are necessary to give entitlement to the pay aspect. Um, clause 2 provides that an employee or worker who meets the defined conditions will be eligible for parental bereavement pay. Uh, the conditions in this regard include the relationship with the child, uh, the relevant week, which is the week after the 26-week period that they've been working for their employer before becoming eligible, that they're still employed with the same employer, and that over an eight-week period prior to the relevant week, uh, their normal weekly earnings are not less than the lower earnings limit of £120. Um, the proposed insertion by Clause 2 uh, also specifies that the entitlement is applicable for each deceased child in the event that a parent has suffered the loss of more than one child. 
Um, the Act will also be amended to allow for regulations that will set the conditions and standards necessary for the administration of payment. Um, clause 2 also ensures that through the insertion into the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act 1992 that the costs of the parental bereavement pay can't be passed on to the employee or their entitlement to it or denied. While it's envisaged that the majority of the bill will be commenced at the same time, uh, the bill also sets out how the Department for Communities will have the ability to, to commence a certain aspect of the schedule, uh, which references the Welfare Reform Order 2015. Um, in this case, there's an amendment to a piece of legislation that has not been commenced by DFC at this point, uh, and DFC is aware of, of that issue um, and in concurrence with it. Um, the schedule to the bill sets out a number of amendments to other pieces of primary legislation that are necessary to incorporate fully uh, parental bereavement leave and pay into various pieces of employment law and social security legislation. That includes references to the statutory pay and leave and also the proposed new articles and sections of the Employment Rights Order and the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act from clauses 1 and 2. Um, so the Bill's main purpose is to create the correct architecture and law that will enable the creation of a new employment right for parents that suffer the loss of a child and those who suffer a stillbirth to a statutory entitlement to two weeks leave and receipt of the statutory payment whilst on that leave. Uh, it will also create the powers needed to allow regulations to be made to give the legislation effect. Our main focus up to now has been the drafting of the Bill and getting it to this stage but we will be required to um, develop a suite of secondary legislation to give the bill full effect. Um, we'll be starting work on drafting that secondary legislation shortly uh, and we'll be looking to run the passage of the primary legislation and drafting the secondary legislation in parallel. Um, we hope to be in a position to extend the new entitlement to workers and employees in Northern Ireland by the 6th of April uh, 2022. Um, and in order to meet that time frame, uh, we will need, if at all possible, to secure royal assent by December of this year uh, to allow for the subsequent uh, process and scrutiny of the secondary legislation, which will take three months. Um, so this is a demanding timetable, but we are very focused on making sure that we are able to introduce this new employment right as soon as possible uh, so that those who may benefit from the changes can do so without delay. Um, and we'll make the regulations available for scrutiny later in the year when we're at the appropriate stage of the drafting and making process. Uh, and obviously we will be in touch with or in front of the committee again uh, once we reach committee stage uh, where we can discuss the content of the bill in more detail. And we would be hopeful that we'll be able to do that before the summer recess. So that's all that I would like to say by way of introduction and uh, my colleagues and I are happy to take any comments or questions. Yeah, thanks very much for, for that. Um, and as you are aware, the committee is very supportive of, of the bringing forward of this bill. And I think um, the Assembly more generally is very supportive of, of the yes. bringing forward of this bill. And I have just a couple of points, and, and I, I raised them, most of them the last day when you were in with us as well. Um, and you will be aware that since you were last in with us, New Zealand has moved to bring miscarriage um, within or leave in, in the instance of miscarriage um, into legislation. So I was wondering if you've had any uh, further consideration of the inclusion of that within the scope of the bill. Um, obviously, it would be um, a very um, compassionate addition to, to this uh, piece of legislation if that was possible. And then in the same kind of um, vein of, of uh, supporting parents who do find themselves in these really, really difficult circumstances, and I think it was included in terms of the consultation itself, but how the leave can actually be taken, and, and it's been proposed that it would be taken in weekly blocks. But um, there may be requirements, for example, for parents to make arrangements for postmortems and um, uh, paediatric postmortems, I think, are carried out in England. Um, so there may be, you know, some requirement to have a day or two here or there to um, to deal with some of the practical 
um, difficulties in relation to, to the death of a child. And I was just wondering, has there been you know, consideration? Obviously, it was considered as part of the consultation, but is that something that you potentially would be open to looking at, um, having a bit more flexibility around? OK, well, I'll take the, the issue of miscarriages first. Um, and we are aware that the uh, New Zealand uh, government has introduced the entitlement to, I think it's three days of um, leave in the case of, of miscarriage. Uh, and I mean, the minister is aware the issue has been raised and she's sympathetic to, to people in, in that position. Um, there are a lot more um, miscarriages uh, each year than uh, children who, who die uh, or, or indeed stillbirths. Um, my understanding is that uh, around one in eight pregnancies end in miscarriage. And so um, you know, we, we have some, done some work to look at what the issues would be about potentially including uh, miscarriage. Um, I mean, our uh, estimates of the cost and so on associated with the bill uh, are based on uh, the information that there are approximately 225 uh, child deaths per year in Northern Ireland. There are probably 2,800 or so miscarriages. So um, it would be quite a significant change to the bill uh, to, to add in miscarriages. So, I mean, the Minister's not... Uh, minded to include miscarriages in the bill at this stage, um, but um, you know she she would be open to monitoring developments elsewhere um, in GB particularly, um, and uh, clearly if 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 there are developments elsewhere, she'd be sympathetic to to following those. Um, I think we we would need to um, consult um, if we were to introduce. Um, an entitlement to, to leave as a result of, of miscarriage, um, but certainly we're, we're aware of the issue, and um, you know we, we can certainly discuss it further uh, at a later stage. Um, in terms of the other issue about uh, post mortems and so on, um, Kelly, do you want to pick that up? You're on mute. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, no, I, I can pick that up, Colin. Yeah, we, you're right, um, Chair. We, we did look in the consultation at how the leave should be taken. Should it be single days or should it be in blocks of weeks um, or should you have to take the two weeks all at once? So um, we, we came down to the decision that you can either take two weeks as one full block or you could take one week and then at a, at a subsequent period of time um, you could take another week. Um, the, the main reason for that is um, for certainty for both employee and employer, also to be able to accommodate the administrative processes for an employer, and also as regards to the statutory pay element, um, all of the processes with HMRC are premised on the fact that it would be taken as a block week. So if we were to change that and split it down into single days, um, it would make the statutory pay element uh, very difficult to actually administer. OK, um, thanks for that. And I suppose I would just respond in relation to the issue around miscarriages and, and monitoring what's done elsewhere. Obviously, employment is a devolved issue. And uh, if we can have the opportunity to, you know, to lead in some things, I think that that's a, a something that we should take because, you know, this is about um, providing uh, compassionate leave to people in really, really difficult circumstances. And uh, certainly I would be arguing in, in respect of that. And I just have one more question, and then if any other members want to come in, um, it's just in relation to, can you speak? Can you speak to the issue of employees versus workers, and what the difference? Why there is that difference? Kelly, do you want to cover that? Yes, I, I can come in on that. Um, just to very, very, very briefly recap so that everybody's absolutely clear um, in this bill what we intend, which is actually the same as what is for all other um, family uh, rights in employment law. Employees will be entitled to both the leave and pay element of the bill. Workers will be entitled to the pay element only. So it's just so so everybody is aware of that. The reasoning for that um, goes back um, obviously decades in employment law, but it comes down to employment status. Um, and em 
employee will have an employment contract with their employer. So there is a mutuality of obligation between the employee and employer about when they should be in work, how many days a work week, how many hours. And for them to not be in work, they must um, discuss that and agree that with their employer. For someone who does not have an employment contract and who is not an employee, that same mutuality of obligation is not there for them to be in work at a certain day, at a certain time. Um, so that's where the distinction is made and has been made for many, many years in employment law. Um, so whilst um, someone who doesn't have an employment contract, doesn't have set hours, um, may need Time, time away from work if they ever did suffer the loss of a child, they still would be able to access the form of statutory pay, whilst they may not have to formally request the leave from, I'm going to say employer, even though they, they don't have an employment contract. That's that's the reasoning for it. Okay. No, thanks for that. that that's useful. Um, does anybody else want to come in on this? Sure, I have no further questions. Okay. This will obviously come back as yep. the bill goes through. No, look, thanks for the, the update and um, look forward to, to this coming forward in the Assembly and, and for the discussions on it once it comes back to committee. Okay, thank you. Thank Jeff. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and just to advise members, we are expecting the bill to be introduced um, next Tuesday, the 25th of May, with the second stage likely being Monday, the 7th of June. So it's actually coming quite quickly. And if we could just seek agreement from members to commission a research paper from Reyes on the bill to be considered once second stage has passed and the bill has been referred to committee. Go ahead, Stuart. Uh, Chair, I appreciate that the bill is narrow in, it, in its scope, but nevertheless, issues that you've raised, for example, with regards to miscarriage, what are the op opportunities available to us to provide amendments to the bill? Chair, we were just, our bid, uh, Ms. Dixon, we were just talking about that, and officials referenced the mostly the parent legislation that will need to be changed for this bill and, and this could be done by amending those mm -hmm. uh, pieces of legislation particularly I think the employment uh, 1996 order yes um, the, the department has looked at that so it's you know a mechanism has obviously been in place but they've uh, the minister isn't minded to go forward because of numbers and cost but in terms of, of legislative process if the committee wanted to put forward an amendment on those issues they could I think it would be valuable for the committee to at least give some consideration yes. to the potential for amendments. I, I agree, and hopefully we can do that. Um, and Peter, just in relation to why would they need to reconsult on that when it was an issue that was raised in the consultation? I think it's the department um, taking the belt and braces approach of anything new would be further consulted on. But obviously, the committee will put out a call for evidence, and that call for evidence could include. Yeah. Um, we did agree that yeah, last week. The consultation yeah. on uh, our, our own um, consultation, if you like, on, on any additional amendments that could be made or should be made to the bill. Um, once once the, the bill comes to committee stage, the committee has that full uh, power to approach its scrutiny in, in whatever way it feels it wants to do. So um, we'll obviously have a bill clerk allocated who will help with amendments. Um, the key issue around amendments is, is always cost. Um, and whether it places an additional um, administrative burden that has to be um, costed as well and you, you, that's when you start to get more kind of pushback if you like from, from particular stakeholders and so yes. on but there's nothing that stops the committee at all looking at all of that yeah. the only caveat I would add is um, time scale yes. the department's made it very clear that there's, there's a requirement for Bit of secondary legislation to enact all this um, and that's going to be done in parallel but will also take some time to bring in um, come the new year so you are talking about a, a very much a, a cliff edge if you like of getting the the bill through getting as far as assent within this this calendar year mm -hmm. um, which which then kind of if you like puts the the question do you get the bill on the statute book and then look to come back to it again to improve it and develop it or do you try and get that done now in process potentially risking time scale okay. but i think you know the committee is aware of that um so it's, it's really a case of working seeing what can be done and constantly being mindful of that time scale yeah and in respect of the numbers and the potential costs 
the, the, the figures they've given them, so yeah. th it's they not that they aren't quantified, so mm -hmm. it's something that we can... Uh, Chair, the, the, the research paper we commission will will look at local jurisdiction comparison, but it'll also look at international best international practice. International best practice. We'll draw in that New Zealand yeah, example exactly. that's come through recently. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, Chair, can I ask a point of clarity there? Um, you know, in relation to um, stillbirth, and miscarriage, what, what are the definitions um, between the two in relation to this bill going forward? After 24 um, weeks is stillbirth. Sorry? So after 24 weeks is considered stillbirth <laughs> and then prior to would be considered miscarriage. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thanks. Okay, members, are, if we're happy enough to do those things, then we'll move on to, to our next briefing. Perfect. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have witnesses yet. So, Chair, what I'll suggest is if we go back to Chair's business, so yep. if you skip on to page seven. Okay. So, that is item number four, um, 4.1 and 4.2. There's a clerk's memo at page 13 and a presentation at page 18 of your packs summarising the informal meeting with the English Language Teaching Colleges last Thursday morning. Um, a number of issues were discussed, including the college's high degree of accreditation and the variety of students attending the college and their contribution to other sectors such as tourism. Whilst the colleges have worked with Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland over many years, they have not been able to access the COVID relief provided to, to that sector. Colleges fear that once the furlough scheme ends in September, they are likely to go out of business as it will be unlikely that their markets will have reopened as, as they uh, rely very much on um, on international and travel uh, as opposed to the domestic market. Um, so if members are content that we would seek to uh, raise the issues outlined by the colleges with the Minister, with Invest NI, with Tourism NI, um, and they also highlighted issues to do with um, Erasmus and visas and the requirement for tier four and tier five visas. So that's something that we would like to also seek to raise with the, um, the House of Lords EU Affairs Committee um, and also the Home Office. There, so our members are content um, that we would do that. It, Chair, in, in relation to Erasmus, it might be useful if we could also make an approach to uh, the equivalent department uh, in the Republic, uh, as they are indicating very strongly that they will continue the Erasmus programme on behalf of students in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I'm very aware uh, that uh, the Richmond TD has asked a couple of questions which there are answers to now, uh, both indicating that they have spoken to the Minister here uh, and that they are continuing to work. But it will require uh, st colleges, student universities and colleges here to uh, register with or partner with a college in the Republic in order to do that and then of course that goes into the wider issue which you've raised around visas and, and the rights to travel and stuff like that so it might be useful if we could contact our counterparts in the Republic as well. Yeah Peter and I am aware that um, my, my party colleague Niall Donlin in the, the Shannon recently raised it with the Minister Simon Harris. He did. Um, and there was a response from Simon Harris which indicated um, that they were, you know, that they were obviously ha had made the suggestion that they would continue with Erasmus, but it won't be required for the new academic year because there are unspent funds in the north. Um, so could we just uh, seek some clarity Perfect. around that? Okay. Uh, Chair, also one of the issues why, was um, that whilst uh, the Republic of Ireland indicated that they would support students from here um, to participate in Erasmus programmes, that it wasn't uh, support for EU students coming in to Northern Ireland, which is a problem for the English language schools. Um, it has to be a flow both ways in order to be productive for the English language schools. And, and we only have three um, you know, substantial English language schools here in Northern Ireland, and these three have been um, cut off and excluded from any support through, um, out, throughout the, the COVID um, pandemic. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they really are been very, very challenged financially. They're, um, they have 
taken on loans, etc. And um, their their business plan going forward is very volatile because um, of the inability to attract students here to Northern Ireland. And it is a very very uh, productive business in terms um, it has a, an economic impact and a multiplier with with many students coming in here and each one pay, spending about four hundred and eighty five pounds per week. You know, um, a very productive um, visitor that comes into Northern Ireland, and there's thousands of them that come in throughout the year. So it's something that we really should be doing. Um, we, should, we should be doing everything and pulling out the stops to give them support going forward and looking to see how we can get the, 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 the free flow of Erasmus students coming in from outside um, of uh, Ireland in here uh, in the future as well. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Sinead. Um, and if members are content, we would write to the um, the Tanishta, the, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, in respect of that issue as well in the South. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving on then, 4.3, there's a response from the ERA committee at page 24 to the committee's letter regarding the handling of future interaction with the um, NI Affairs Committee in regards to the scrutiny of the protocol. The ERA committee agrees with, the, um, with our committee's approach to facilitate future enga engagement by a correspondence, so that is for members to note. And then 4.4 page four, or 4 .4 at page 25 of your pack. The Chair of the New House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee, Lord Jay, um, there is correspondence on the protocol following the end of the term of the House of Lords EU Committee. The Chair outlines it, its inquiry into the current state of play with the protocol and its six areas of work, and the Committee Chair hopes to further engage with our committee and has suggested an initial uh, introductory phone call with, with me of chair, as Chair of this committee. So if members are content for the clerk to arrange that initial phone call um, and that the committee agrees uh, to continue its engagement with that inquiry as it proceeds. Okay. Thank you. And then just 4.5, it's not in our pack, but just to seek a member's agreement to ask the Department for its um, submission to the Department, for, De Department of Finance for June monitoring. Thank you. Okay, okay so we're going to go back now to item number six. six. Um, find it in my paper. Uh, some has not made it. Um, okay, so item number six. Then there's a briefing from um, student union representatives. There is a clerk's memo at page 101 of your pack. There is a paper from NUS USI on issues facing students at page 104 of your packs. And if I could just um, welcome into this morning's meeting. Ellen Farron, who is president of NUS USI, Jonathan Reid, who is president of um, Stram Millis, Graham Nidalvin, who is president of Queen's, and uh, Colette Cassidy, who's president of Ulster, and Deglin Omer, who, who is president of St Mary's. So if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement, and um, then we'll bring members in for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Kiva. Um, I am going to kick off and then I'll hand over to um, the new president after that. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us here today. And um, I also just want to say that we do really appreciate the level of support that we've had from this committee and especially different members of this committee over the last year. Um, I'm Ellen Fern. I'm president of NUSUSI, which is the National Union of Students here um, in NNI. So we're made up of 200,000 students across the north, um, across higher and further education. Um, and I know that we also have representation today from our four HE SUs as well. Um, I think it's just so vitally important that the student voice is being heard at all levels of government. We are just such a unique and large section of the population and we need the room. We need to be in the room for our issues to be understood by those in government. Um, so it is really, really good to be here this morning. Um, I suppose I only have a few minutes here um, and I, I'll try to be really quick. We know, all know that students are facing a wide range of issues at the minute, which have been massively, massively magnified by COVID-19. Um, so I don't have to, the time to go into all of them, but the briefings that we've sent around from NUS USI um, will provide you with a, a good overview of, of the year that students have had. Um, one issue I suppose that I'd like to talk about, which we've worked on as part of our Students Deserve Better campaign this year, is the £500 COVID disruption payments. As it stands, three quarters of students in this country are not eligible for the COVID study disruption payment, despite having faced just as much disruption to their studies as the students who have got it. 
That includes further education students, part-time students, thesis-only students, international students and other groups as well. I know this committee has followed this story very, very closely, so we don't need to repeat it today, but I think it actually offers us a perfect case study for the challenges that we have faced throughout the whole pandemic in trying to get the supports for students that they need. The £500 COVID disruption payment at the end of February to full-time HE students was, of course, extremely welcome and appreciated and definitely helped a lot of students out. But it was and continues to be a short-term partial solution to a much, much wider problem. Student finance doesn't cover students' cost of living, and with the industries that many students rely on for part-time work closed because of COVID, students have had no option but to fall deeper and deeper into financial hardship over the last 14 months. We've been raising this problem with the government since the very first week of the pandemic, and so far we've seen absolutely no long-term strategies to support students to cope financially. The payment excluded vast numbers of students with broad generalizations being used as reasoning for these exclusions. Time and time again, we've witnessed outdated and simplistic views of the student population leading to real harmful policy making, which ignores the reality of students' lives. One example is that um, the Further Education Student Hardship System, which requires students to provide details of their parents' income and finances if they're under the age of 25, um, that's an excessive burden of proof, which isn't asked of higher education students of the same age taking hardship. And I think it's beyond reason that the government would make such a wide assumption that an FE student has more financial student have more financial support from their family than a HE student. And we see generalisations and harmful assumptions like that so much within the financial support system. In debates about extending the £500 payment, we saw arguments around the difficulty of setting up a system to extend the grant being used as an excuse to do nothing about it. This will come as no surprise to student renters who for the last 14 months have had no support to help them pay for contracts or leave contracts for houses that they no longer need. Some of which they've signed contracts for because they were told they needed to be on campus only to have their classes moved online almost immediately at the start of the academic year. We've been passed back and forth between different departments on this issue before finally being told that it's up to Westminster. Yet we've seen little evidence of the NI executive lobbying Westminster for support. The welfare of people in this country is not outside the remit of the NI executive and a problem should not be ignored just because it's challenging. There are so many issues students have faced this year and every year that have slipped through the cracks because no department will take responsibility for it. Um, because the HE and FE policy branches in DFE don't fully know what the other is doing at times and student support isn't adding up across the board. Or because student issues are simply seen as too complex to tackle. That approach that's been going on for years leads to students' actual lives and welfare slipping through the cracks in response. And finally, I just want to say the Minister's lack of engagement with NUSUSI and unwillingness to devote time and resources to student issues may have come to a surprise to some members of this committee, but it was absolutely no surprise to us. This is definitely symptomatic of a much wider lack of interest and lack of regard which we've struggled with since the formation of the Economy Department. We appreciate that this is a very, very large department with a very large remit, and you will know that better than anyone, but that isn't an excuse to push student issues to the side. If ministers cannot devote the, act, the adequate time that is needed to truly engage on third level education across the board, then I think perhaps the NI executive needs to review the department's portfolio as a whole. So going forward, I think we want the Economy Committee to take some time to reflect on this department's handling of student issues right from the very beginning and to consider the message that um, that sends to students across the country because it's been very, very disappointing. Um, we believe that students deserve better than how they've been treated this year and that this government needs to do better. Um, there's still so many unanswered questions about the year going forward. If students are going to be asked to, to sign on to a lease for the third academic year in a row that they don't need, because again, there's no national plan for returning to campuses. There's no long-term strategic plan for, for student financial support. And we just have so many more unanswered questions before September. And we just don't want to see a repeat of this year that we see every single year. Um, so we need the minister to take responsibility to ensure that we've been through doesn't continue to happen every single year and we need long-term action for our students um yeah thanks for listening i will look forward to taking any of your questions at the end but i'm going to hand over to green um Nigavin from the president of queen's university students union thanks alan uh, hi folks, Gia Dave, it's Misha Green. So my name is Green and I'm the Queen's Student Junior President this year. Um, I'm very aware of time and I hope you don't mind just because this meeting went over, I do have to leave early for another engagement. Um, but Ellen touched on a lot of the issues that I myself am going to touch on as well. Um, <clears throat> 
I'm probably going to touch on three main areas. So over the past year, um, you no, know, Ellen touched on the issue of student renters and student housing. We were told as you no know, student representatives and student activists that um, we were told that this executive didn't really have much of a remit um, to deal with um, to deal with student renters and you no know, waiving rent and um, you no know, being able to suspend rents and things like that. But you no, know, student rent has gone completely. Is my internet okay? Is it? It's breaking up a wee bit, but we can we can hear you okay. Here, the sounds fine. No point. Um, and so. Um, student renters were told that the executive was very limited in what they could do for student renters. If it's the case that this executive doesn't have the powers that student renters need to support student renters, I'm uh, no. We believe that it's of the opinion that the the executive needs to be helping cover their rents because they're taking out leases at the minute, something that they were doing exactly at this point last year. Um, and no, we don't know if there's going to be another spike with the variants come up. up come autumn um, and we don't want to see students in the exact same situation that they're in now. Um, this can't be repeated again. As well, um, my colleague and uh, also student Jean, so Colette will touch more on the Student Mental Health Action Plan, but this urgently needs, to, no student mental health was in crisis before the pandemic and it's only been exacerbated because of the pandemic. We need the Student Mental Health Action Plan that was pulled together by UUSU and other student unions to be implemented and they have the proper you know, time, time and money invested in it. Um, and just to finish off, the third thing that I am uh, going to touch on um, is that the issue of student refunds and financial compensation for this year I don't, and my colleagues don't believe that this is something that's been seriously, seriously considered by um, by the executive um, and by politicians um, here in the north. I think it's vitally important that we recognise that we are currently in a system that op that we're universe are forced to operate as businesses, are forced to you know, use international student fees that are massively high when not actually offering. Um, international students the support that they need financially because they can't access public funds. Um, the system here at the moment, you know, it's, it's really hard to get into because of the financial barriers. There are students that will not, that can't access education unless they have the student loan scheme. And you no, know, in that scheme in itself, that puts students into debt for the for you no know, years after they leave university. Um, and in a system where they have been told that they're paying for service, they have not got that service or that experience this year. It's time, it's high time that this committee and that the executive and politicians here really, really start planning for to fully fund higher education because the system that we're in now just is not sustainable, it's not manageable, and it's not working. Um, so I hope that um, you should consider that this is something that seriously needs to happen. It's not a pipe dream uh, kind of you know, far off distant thing that we're aiming for. This is a realistic and necessary uh, action that needs to be talked by this executive now. Thank you, Gurmagov. Thanks, Green. Um, who's coming in next? Sorry, next on my screen is Deglin, but I don't know who is wanting to come in. Um, I can come in. Um, sure. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Reed. I'm Student Junior President at um, Stramalis. And really it's just highlighting a lot of um, the areas that have already been covered. Um, primarily just a roadmap coming out of um, lockdown and everything. Students, you know, haven't been told what is happening. And it's the same position we were last year. We weren't too sure what was going to be happening, as in are the classes going to be online? Are they going to be on campus? Are we going to be in campus, you know, halls and accommodation? And a year later, we're still in the same place. I think it's vitally important, you know, students are going to be told what is going to be the plans for next year and how that's going to affect them. Because in the news recently over in England, you know, a lot of the universities are saying, you know, we are going to be keeping the online lectures running until December. And a lot of students have been coming up to me going, is this the case at Stranmellis? Is this the case at Queen's? And we don't know because that's the honest truth, unfortunately. 
Um, so clear, clear, clear guidance is vitally needed for students in sort of all areas like that, um, as well as that the financial disruption payment to students was welcomed by the full time, but part time students and obviously um, further education, they have not been um, given this um, payment. Uh, a lot of our master's students are part time because they are doing other things outside this and they have not been supported in the same way. So we'd also just call for more support given to all students in all aspects, but more guidance and um, the disruption payment to be given out to everyone. And that's kind of all I want to do before I repeat more what everyone else is saying. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm going to come in next, Kiva. So hello, everybody. My name is Colette Cassidy, and I'm the president of UUSU. Again, as we've all said, we are going to be bringing um, up the same issues, but I think it is important to raise these issues consistently because it's important for everyone to realise that this is not impacting on a designated um, university or um, for the education college. It's impacting all students, no matter where they're coming from. So again, as everyone else has raised, we obviously had the COVID disruption grant along with the other funding that was introduced back in back in February. Again, we all know the gaps that have came as a result of that funding, particularly within the COVID disruption grant. We have seen the likes of our part-time students and our non-EU international students being excluded from this money. And I think it's important to note that no matter what mode of study that these students have went through, they all have been impacted by the disruption that COVID has made during their academic year. And I know personally within us universities, uh, us University that there has been students who have moved from full-time education to part-time education as a result of the disruption that they have faced this year and as a result of that move have now been excluded from the disruption grant when it should be there to support them students at the time that they most need it. Going ahead and looking into the next academic year, we are at a point now that discussion should be underway. Um, our government and, our, and particularly this department should be supporting our students and supporting the university in looking ahead to September because we can't have a repeat of what we've just witnessed um, throughout this year. We have been here with you both in October and now today discussing the same similar issues again and again and again. And it is about time that action is taken and we just can't consistently be having these discussions. Um, I am leaving and some of us will be leaving in June. So for my successor to come in here in July and have these same discussions means no action is being taken. Finally, folks, I am being quick with this because I know we, we are under time, but we have all given the issues and we know that as a result of the issues that we're facing is impacting on our students' mental health. Um, as Green and others have said that on the 4th of March this year on University Mental Health Day, UUSU did launch our um, Students' Mental Health Action Plan. Within that is eight points that we feel are important for the department and our government to be aware of, to be able to support our students, particularly with their mental health. This has been in consultation with students, has been developed by students. We have listened and heard the live experiences our students have been presented with this year and years before, because as Graham and others have said, we have been in a mental health crisis and we still are. So again, I think that action plan definitely needs to be prioritized within, our, within this department and within government um, to support our students in the long term. As I've said, we have met both in October and today, and we have outlined and identified the issues that students ha have been impacted with throughout this year, and it is time for action. And the only way that this action can be achieved is consistent discussions and consultation with SU representatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colette. And Deglin, do you want to come in just before we open it up to members? Yeah. Grandma Okiva, especially Jane Laura, who I was telling you, I'm Mark Ogdran, College Hill School, Navarra. Um, thank you very much, Kiva. My name is David Murphy, and I'm here as president of St Mary's University College Belfast. Um, the thing that I would like to talk about is the grant that was approved there last month. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the Department of the Economy for this grant. It was a great idea in theory. However, in practice, it proves quite difficult to spend the money. Um, we put out ideas to the students to see what they would most want. To avail of, and one of the ideas that they put in place was an individual fitness and nutrition plan. There's been fantastic interest in this. However, we've been made to jump through hoops to spend this money. The amount of money being spent means that we needed to go through tender, and every penny of this has been scrutinised and audited. 
This would have been fine if the money would have been distributed back in semester one, but it wasn't. It was approved in May, whenever our students are doing their exams and about to switch off for the summer, meaning that they will not be looking at their university email accounts and therefore may not achieve the full engagement which we would have uh, been made possible if this initiative would have happened back in late 2020. Also, at this time of year, when our student representatives are about to leave, meaning that the people in office, myself and everybody here, will not be able to see out the full commitment to the expenditure of this money and to our students, and therefore I believe that there's been a lack of engagement in terms of this, in my opinion. Grandma um, Grandma Dylan. Um, and just, I suppose, to come in, as you, if you recognise and, and I appreciate that you have recognised um, the committee has been very willing to engage and um, has been very exercised by, by issues relating to students over the, the past year. Um, we have been very concerned about the lack of engagement. Um, we have been very concerned about the, um, the, the delay, I suppose, in terms of action being taken to support students. And, and, um, and we have done our best to engage with the minister and the department and to encourage um, action to be taken um, as speedily as possible. And, and it is, I suppose, a limitation of a committee. We, we can advocate on your behalf, but the, the ultimate decisions come down to, to the minister in, in respect of it. Um, and we will continue to um, advocate on your behalf. Um, and we, we hear all of the issues that you have outlined today. Um, the committee has, as you are aware, made significant representations on the issue of the COVID disruption uh, payment. We are still waiting on responses back from the Minister and Department in respect of uh, why it can't be extended, um, some of the legal issues apparently that there are around that. There are other uh, ways that it could be extended, as you've outlined yourself, to part-time students, um, to international students and to FE students, that there are no legal barriers to and that we believe should be uh, paid out to those students. We will continue to make that case. Um, in respect of some of the, the other issues that you have outlined, we have been engaging with the universities and the departments and the colleges in respect of planning for next academic year. We are hopeful that there will, will be better uh, planning and preparation for the next academic year and greater guidance and certainly that's what we will be calling for. Um, we don't want to see a situation like last year where students end up taking on contracts um, and everything else and end up uh, out of pocket again. Now obviously there can be no certainty and we all know all that, you know, we don't, we, none of us can see into the future and know uh, what the situation will be in respect of COVID in the next academic year, but there has to be adequate quick planning and contingency planning around all of those things and certainly that's what we'll be calling for um, off the back of today's engagement and of our previous engagements with yourselves and with the universities and colleges. We are very aware of the broader issues around um, further and higher education funding and funding into the future. Um, we are realistic in that respect as well, that it's not something that is likely to be dealt with in this current mandate, but it is something that the committee is very um, conscious of and is keen to see uh, properly addressed and that we have, we are looking at in the context particularly of the new skills strategy, which is um, being developed at the minute as well. So there's an awful lot of issues there that are probably beyond um, the, the, the end of this mandate, but certainly it is part of our programme of work. And then just to pick up on the point around um, that Green mentioned around uh, re refunds and, and things like that for students in relation to fees. It's something that we have engaged with the executive, with the British government, and um, and whatever your view around students as consumers, um, and certainly none of us would, would maybe be uh, thinking that that should be the case, but we have engaged with the Consumers Council on that issue as well as to what students' issue, uh, rights are in respect of being consumers and uh, of paying for a service that may not be delivered to the standard that they expected or, or outlined in, in, um, when they signed up. So just to give you that feedback um, from a committee perspective to, to uh, reassure you that, that we will continue to do our best um, in outlining uh, student issues, that we will continue to call for real meaningful engagement with student union representatives 
um, it is absolutely essential. You are representative of 200,000 students, as, as you have outlined, Ellen, um, and it is really important that students are listened to. Um, I'm going to bring in members for, for questions or comments. Um, Sinead, you're first up. Oh, I think you're on mute, Sinead. Sorry for that, but thank you very much, everybody, for your, um, your, your briefing and your representation today. And I think it's important that you came before the committee again. Uh, and also, um, the fact is that you will be moving on um, towards the end of this academic year. And I want to thank you for uh, the, the sterling representation that you have given to your various bodies because it, it has been, you know, it's been a trying time for all students, but particularly those that are representing student bodies too. It has been a very difficult time and I totally appreciate that. And I'm sure student bodies do as well. Um, look, I, I mean, what can I say? We, we know the issues. Um, very familiar with the issues uh, and it's regrettable that some of them are still unresolved as we speak. Um, uh, we've been at, at this now for almost 14 months and it's one step forward, two steps back uh, and uh, uh, it is a regrettable issue. Now what I really want to, to, to do, obviously we are pushing as a committee um, to, to see if we can get the, the COVID payments um, spread and more inclusive to include all of the those that have been excluded, ROI, GB, um, international students, part-time students, etc. And we will remain uh, and keep uh, the foot on the accelerator regarding that. But I, I'm really concerned about the new academic year and what is ahead for um, our new students cohort and as student representatives are you working with your various um, you know institutions to find out exactly and contribute to how the new year is going to pan out for for students coming in and what um, uh, what clauses may be put in to any leases um, that students may be undertaking um, so maybe I'll hand that over to Ellen in the first sentence to see if she can uh, give me any light to just the work that you are doing um, with your various uh, institutions. Yeah, thank you, Sinead. Um, I suppose from a national point of view, I, I don't engage with institutions directly, but um, so I'll, I'll hand over to the other SU presidents maybe to chat about what, um, what conversations you've had internally about that new academic year. Um, I would say, though, that I know that you will all be very familiar that um, from July to October last year, we spent our time just really lobbying for a national plan for return to campus, and it, it never came through, and it, it did lead to a lot of chaos, um, and that is something that we want to see for this year. We do think the government has a responsibility to bring the colleges and the universities together to make a clear plan so that every student knows what is happening. Um, so that is sort of the role that, that we're trying to play, but again, engagement has been very difficult. Um, in terms of leases, clauses being put into leases, um, as far as we're aware, there is no change, and that is entirely disappointing, I suppose. We really are just um, at the mercy of landlords and their generosity, which isn't very forthcoming in a lot of cases. Um, so it, it definitely is a case where um, in the private rented sector, students again are signing into house contracts for another 12 months um, that they may or may not need. And in many cases, they're being encouraged to do so again, which is very disappointing um, by private landlords. Um, but I will let um, maybe Clet, if you want to go first, and then um, Daglin and Johnny about um, the institution specifically and maybe um, university owned accommodation. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Sinead, for your question. I suppose in terms of engagement with the with the university, from our standpoint, um, all USU officers are involved in, in many committees. Um, and I meet with the VC on a monthly basis to discuss the issues that students are facing. Um, so in terms of the academic um, you know, uh, issues that students face, we are a part of them committees and, and help um, and ensure that academics have understanding of what students are facing. And as a result of that, we've had throughout the year, the introduction of the likes of the recording lecture policies, um, the likes of uh, resets being taken as first sets, um, again, to obviously ensure that um, no stress goes upon the student and they have as much flexibility around being able to complete this academic year. Um, in terms of the leases, um, obviously, uh, we have the university owned accommodation and, you know, as well as that, we obviously have the private rented. So again, as Ellen has said, 
the private rented accommodation nothing has changed if students are signing accommodation that's them you know tied into it and they can't get out um, and again you know we've seen last year where before the pandemic happened where students you know weren't aware no one was aware of what COVID was going to bring and it signed them and again there was no flexibility given from landlords and again you know this has happened this year and students are coming to us panicking worried that if you know if the academic year happens to be you know on campus or we're going to have elements of study on campus what are we doing and of course you know we can't foresee what is going to happen either so there should be flexibility in there by landlords to obviously have that if you know the pandemic does happen there is a get out of the least cause of course because you know we can't foresee this and to expect students to sign on the contracts for 9 10 12 months is just not reasonable unfair unjust um, in terms of the university accommodation we have um, discussions with um, uh, the, those who are um, to, who have it who own it within the within the university and we consistently meet them to ensure that there is flexibility given for students um, and you know obviously there has been discussions with the university to ensure that if students are not going to be on campus and, and you know can be seen on the likes of their study that they are going to be studying online there's ways and means of, of getting out of them contracts so the university accommodation can be a lot flexible compared to obviously that private rent rented so hopefully, hopefully that gives you an insight in, into what is going on Sinead. Uh, I had a meeting last week with Queen's University accommodation team and, you know, we talked about the flexibilities and, the, uh, and the, perhaps the requirements of bedding them down for the new academic year that's approaching. Like, I'm really conscious of, you know, a lot of people are talking about holidays and booking holidays, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But the one thing that everybody is assured of um, is that if they do book a holiday and they can't go on the holiday, then they can recover their money. Why is the same consideration not given to students who are booking accommodation and may not be able to give it? It's straightforward and it seems to be just, you know, the student, uh, I suppose, lobbying is not uh, regarded in the same way uh, as personal business lobbying um, and happens uh, without, throughout the UK, which is really regrettable. Um, you know, and, and I do realise that the, the, the students or the universities, Queen's and Ulster University, have been flexible and have worked with the students. Um, the private sector, not so much. Uh, and that uh, is difficult. And, and I feel, you know, at this point in time, um, the, the, the students themselves have, have had a very high price to pay for it all. Thanks, Sinead. Um, can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, hello. Um, quite clearly a very difficult year for, for students. Um, but also in fairness to yourselves, you have also raised the profile and voices of students very effectively and achieved a lot over this last year. Uh, um, so well done in that regards. There's much more to do. Um, I, I fail to say at times, as a former minister, there was always things you wanted to do, but perhaps didn't have the money to do. But I, I fail to see on this occasion why Minister Dodds didn't resolve some of the issues because there was access and continues to be access to quite significant amounts of COVID funds, which could have resolved some of the problems that continue to be faced uh, in the students' arena, but not all of them, of course. Given that we may, in the weeks ahead, have a new person in the economy minister's role, or we may have the same person, what would your main ask be of that person moving ahead uh, in the next weeks and months? Um, yeah, I'm happy to come in on this if, if you're happy enough. Um, I suppose, yeah, we, we don't want to predict what is going to happen there, but I think for either an ongoing minister or a new minister coming into this department, our biggest ask overall is that student issues be given the time of day within the department. Um, I sort of said in my opening there, like, we completely understand this is such a massive, massive remit, but if, if the minister cannot deal with every single section of a remit, then the remit shouldn't look like that and the portfolio maybe needs to be broken up. Um, I know that we, we used to have... Um, a different department to deal with third level education and that's maybe something that needs to be locked into but i suppose in the short term we just need um regular engagement with the minister so that our, our officials so that we can 
relay these student issues regularly and so that we don't build up to the point of disaster which we've seen at multiple points throughout this year where we've we've resulted in mental health disaster for students, financial disaster, um, because those issues have been allowed to build to crisis point rather than dealing with them in a long-term strategic way, which is what we need. Um, so I suppose from my point of view, the biggest ask would be regular engagement with the minister and with officials so that issues can be dealt with and the need to look at long-term strategic solutions and long-term action. Um, finally, for student issues, so that some of these students that issues we've been talking about for decades now can finally start to be resolved. Um, so from my point of view, I think those are definitely the most important things to look at, um, either with an ongoing minister or if a new minister does come into this department. Okay. In, in, in terms of engagement, I know, I know the minister has a met these are in recent times, but in terms of engagement with the department, is there regular engagement with officials? Is there a dedicated point of contact for the students? Unions' voices to be heard. Are you members of any of the multitude of forums that have been established over this last year or so? Um, so I, I said on um, a few different government groups, but very few, to be honest, mostly to do with um, further education and apprenticeships, and um, none for higher education that I can think of whatsoever. Um, and I, to be honest, I think that is because there isn't um, an official forum for dealing with higher education issues. Um, and if there is, then it's, it's being kept secret from us. <laughs> but um, I, I think that's a problem in itself, because if that doesn't exist, then that's obviously a core point of the issue, um, that it's not even being given its own sort of group to, to deal with. Um, we have we have various meetings. We have regular meetings with um, the Further Education branch, branch not the HE branch. Um, we do have issues when, when certain specific issues come up, but I think it's just important that we're given that regular engagement to deal with ongoing issues rather than again those crisis points i think we tend to get meetings when things happen at crisis point with officials rather than the minister but that's just not enough because at that point it's too late to actually bring forward solutions and um, it's just constant firefighting um which just isn't an effective way to run a department i suppose um from our point of view and um, i don't know if any of the others want to come in on that Again, as Ellen has said, it is that engagement. And yes, we have, you know, I'm sure every single one of the presidents um, in local unions have been contacted by, you know, individual MLAs, councillors to have discussions. Um, but again, you know, it obviously has to be brought further um, and, and to actually be in the room instead of, you know, trying to get someone to bring us into the room isn't fair and isn't right and isn't the right way to be doing it. Um, you know, I know we've formed, you know, an all party group, but that has been us having to form it. Um, and, and making them connections and, and pushing it out and, and realistically it should be the other way around. So efforts have been made from our, you know, our point of making sure that we get the voices of students heard um, by those who obviously can create change. But, you know, there needs to be a bit of um, give and go with these sort of things. OK, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, apologies, I've been having some technical difficulties uh, this morning. But uh, first of all, I, I just want to put on record my thanks uh, to everyone on the call. Um, first of all, for the respectful way that you have engaged over this past year, but also in the way that you've uh, highlighted the genuine uh, concerns that are, that are facing the students that uh, you represent. Um, I, I think there is an acknowledgement, obviously, of the financial support that has been provided, uh, albeit I, I clearly recognise that uh, whilst it may uh, seem a lot in terms of the 37 million, there have been a lot of people left behind, a lot of, and there have been gaps. So, so I'm not, I'm not, not for one minute uh, trying to take away from the serious issues which exist. And it has been uh, mentioned about uh, the likes of the all-party group, uh, which, which I sit on and Karen uh, Mullen chairs. Uh, and, you know, it's a bit like this committee. Uh, we can meet the concerns, so we can uh, send letters. Um, we can uh, do all of that. Uh, but that, that's important in terms of the lobby. But unless we see action at the other end, then uh, unfortunately uh, it's not much use other than the fact that we continue to raise those issues. Um, one of the main concerns that, that I have heard right throughout the pandemic, uh, not exclusively the students, but uh, because we're, we're dealing with uh, the, these issues today, um, you know, it is important to recognise that the clarity piece is so important. 
um, and and going into the next semester, I think that uh, as a committee, it's, it's it's our intention to try and drag as much clarity out as possible, um, because it shouldn't be a hierarchy in terms of who deserves clarity the most. I think that students are uh, are, are up there in terms of the need for that as well. Uh, I, I take the, the issue around the mental health action plan very seriously as well. I know that um, we received uh, figures at the all party group, group in relation to some of the stark statistics affecting students. Uh, that's something that should concern everybody in this committee, regardless of what party uh, you, you're affiliated to. Um, you know, and, and uh, I think as a committee, we can maybe put a bit more pressure in terms of the ministerial working group there around mental health to, to, to try and bring uh, those issues to the forefront. Uh, for going ahead, um, look, I will continue to make the case uh, with the minister. Uh, I don't want to, as I say, speculate in terms of what happens in the next couple of weeks, but what we need to do is we need to see a, a ramping up of the engagement. I, I don't uh, see why um, th th there shouldn't be strong engagement with students. Um, I, I think that an action point would be we need to maybe see a forum uh, where the, the you know we would have departmental representation um whether that be at ministerial level or very senior level um i suppose that, that can be decided but i think that the minister needs to, to engage um but also that we need to see the students um in, in around the table as well so it's not so much a question it's just an acknowledgement that i, I genuinely do hear the concerns um uh, you know, I'd, I'd continue to, to raise those concerns as well. Um, and as I say, I just I, I welcome the engagement and I hope that as a committee we can form some sort of consensus position around, the, I think we have a consensus around dealing with the issues, but in terms of how we improve the communication and that that needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. Uh, again, thank you. Sorry for maybe just speaking a bit long, but I, I do thank you and wish you well as you go on um, to your, your next stage or you move on from the post that you're currently in. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Gary. And I know, Ellen, that you have previously highlighted that in Wales and Scotland there are regular meetings with senior departmental officials, officials and student representatives. Um, that's something we've highlighted previously, but I think certainly there will be no harm in doing so again and encouraging the department to set up a, a similar engagement with student representatives here. Um, I don't have any more questions for you either. I would really like to put on record my thanks for your very constructive um, and useful engagement and, as Gary says, respectful engagement despite the really difficult year that you have all had. Um, I would wish all of you very well in whatever you are doing um, after the end of this um, academic year and would, would welcome the opportunity if you are having any sort of transition with the new people coming in to um, engage with me as committee chair um, and I'm so sure you would be doing with other representatives anyway. But um, would we really welcome the opportunity to do that and just again to assure you that, that we will continue um, to highlight student issues and to be calling for as much clarity and engagement as is absolutely possible. Chair, if, if I could come in, it would be really helpful for me if you all forwarded on contact details for those who follow behind you. And Ellen, if it's possible, could you put me in contact with your Scottish and Welsh counterparts? It might be useful to get a talk to them as to how the mechanisms they're involved in work, just so that we can pin down detail and maybe develop our own model. Yes, no problem at all. Yeah, I think that would be really useful. Um, and just to say as well, I actually am in this role for another year, um, so you are stuck with me for another year. But I'll also be working with the new officers that come in from each union and each president, so I'm happy to coordinate any of that that you need as well. Chair, if, um, I, could, but that, that's very helpful. if I could just come in again, well, that, that would be incredibly useful, Ellen, if you actually set that up for us, um, if, you, if you want to sort of think about the, the sort of time scale for doing that, um, in terms of bringing together a meeting of the new officials, um, so that we can maybe have an informal with the committee as soon as they're in office. Yep. Thank you. Um, and Peter, just to maybe to propose that we do ask for um, departmental officials to come and talk to us about student issues um, as a, an action out of this meeting. Sure, we'll do that, Chair. Sure. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much.
Okay, um, unless members have anything else that they want to, to add or as action points or anything else out of the briefing. Chair, it was just maybe to mention, look, that the, the forum idea, I think, is um, is one that, that, that needs to be explored. I don't know if we can find out, and probably um, maybe I could have asked this question, but in terms of other jurisdictions, whether it be in, in our one or whether it be in Scotland or Wales, how do they, do they have specific forums and what, what's the makeup of those forums? And is, is it something that we need to be lobbying to establish here? Um, you know, within our um, assembly as well. I don't know. It, it, it maybe some just to inquire for a future meeting. Chair, that that's hopefully what we'll get from Alan. She has counterparts um, in Wales and Scotland. That's the beauty of the NUSUSI. Um, so if we look at the mechanisms they have, what we can do is bring a, a report back to committee for discussion in terms of having a you know a kind of being able to look at a, a model proposal. That the committee can then take forward. Okay. Okay. Thanks um, for that. Okay. So we'll move on then to. I'm just making sure, sure we're going to 13. Yeah, we're going to go back to 13. Yeah. Okay. So there is an SL1 item number 13, um, proposed insolvency amendment 2016 Act, consequential amendments and revocation order Northern Ireland 2021. There's a clerk's memo at page 192 of table papers. There's an SL1 at page 193. The proposed statutory rule revokes the deeds of arrangement regulations Northern Ireland 1996 and makes amendments to subordinate legislation consequent on the repeal of the provision in the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1998, enabling debtors to enter deeds of arrangement. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. Um, and this is the committee's opportunity uh, to consider the policy laid out at the uh, or in the SL1. Apologies. Um, so, are members content with Peter's anything you want to say on it? No, chair. It, it's pretty much as it says on the tin. It's part of this suite of re remaking these resolutions because of the the times we live in, um, and it is really there on that basis. Okay. Are members content? Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to um, item number 14, SR 2021-000, the Renewables Obligation Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2021 Amendment to the Explanatory Memorandum. Um, there is a copy of the revised Explanatory Memorandum at page 161 of your pack in relation to the SR on the Renewables Obligation Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2021, which we agreed on the 28th of April. The amendment is technical in nature and reflects the change to the articles of the parent legislation under which the SR was made. So there is no amendment to the draft SR itself. So that is just for members to note. And so we are moving on then to item number seven. We're all over the place today. Um, <laughs> So, at page 113 of your packs, there's a departmental response following issues raised after the recent budget briefing, um, which included a breakdown of the funding from Treasury from, for the protocol and for the FTC uh, loan to Ulster University. The department outlines that the funding is allocated to the Department for the Economy by NIO. Um, is part of the commitment to implement new new deal for Northern Ireland to help boost economic growth, competitiveness, and invest in infrastructure. So that's for members to note, unless there's anything they want to say. Chair, it's maybe worth flagging up on that table too, um, on, on page 113, is that roughly just slightly over half the money um, is actually committed in terms of specifics to bodies and so on and, and it's probably that top line that's the the, the one members maybe want to um would want to highlight is the the five point um seven. seven nine one that's still effectively in that pot for coping with protocol and trade issues um i know we've dealt a lot with that figure of that headline figure of 12.1 but it's just to say that that slightly over half of that is, is already committed um as that table sets out so just if members want to keep that in mind going forward okay um, and we may want to ask for further information in relation to that. Yeah, sure. It, it'll be a, a case of um, 
The drawdown on the trade and protocol policy, the, the nearly 5.8 million that's left, will probably have to come through monitoring rounds. Um, so we should see that coming through them, but certainly it's one to keep an eye on. Right, thank you. So then 7.2, page 116, there's a departmental response to correspondence forwarded by the committee from a manufacturer in business regarding disadvantages manufacturers here face when competing with businesses in Britain due to the rules of origin for goods travelling from Britain to the north for processing. The department states that it shares the concerns and that officials are engaged on a technical level across um, Whitehall to seek urgent resolutions. In terms of interim options, HMRC has advised that businesses should explore potential mitigations for this tariff, such as customs processes, including inward processing relief and customs warehousing, and also the de minimis uh, waiver. So if members are content that we will forward that response to the individual who raised this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Then 7.3 at page 117, there's correspondence from the Clerk of the Finance Committee regarding information from the Department for or the Department of Finance, sorry, on the accruing resources within departments for the year 2020-21. Um, just to advise members, the Department for Economy figures are set out on pages 123 to 24. That's just for members to note. Then 7.4 at page 4 of table papers, there is a copy of the statement by the Education Minister to the Assembly on the 17th May regarding arrangements for SIA qualifications in 2021-22. Um, the SIA is due to brief the committee on the 23rd of June. Chair, it might just be worth flagging up. I have had a preliminary discussion with the Interim Chief Executive on the issues that the committee wants to um, deal with. Um, so it looks as it will be a, a fairly good um, meeting, I think, an exchange. Uh, I think the interim chief executive um, has, has, yeah, it's, it's, I suppose spoiler alert, but has, has a lot of views on those issues as well that, that you know, I think there will be useful discussion on. Okay, thanks, Peter. So then 7.5 at page 19 of table papers, there is follow-up information from, from Ulster University following our informal meeting on the 25th of March. So that, again, is just for members to note. Um, 7.6 then at page 32 of table papers, there is a copy of correspondence from a college lecturer to the minister regarding issues around the ongoing pay dispute. So if members are content, we will uh, write to the department to ask that the response is copied to the committee. If members are content. Chair, can I, can I just bob in again there? It occurs to me, um, I had a conversation with the education clerk and they're looking at um, a lot of issues around provision in schools for young people with autism. And I, I, I mentioned the neurodiverse student group um, to the clerk and, and there was a, you know, there's obviously a, a, there's a correlation there. So if members are content, could we f um, forward that correspondence to the education committee? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So 7.7 7 then at page 35 of table papers, there is corresponding, correspondence from Belku Frac Free regarding the department's handling of previous requests from the group. So members of contempt will forward that correspondence to the department for a response on the issues being raised. Thank you. And then we're moving on to item number eight, which is the Rating Coronavirus and Directors Disqualification Dissolve Companies Bill. Um, there is a copy of the rate in coronavirus uh, and directors disqualification dis dis dissolve companies bill, um, which has been laid in Westminster at page 130 of your pack and an explanatory memorandum at page 140. The bill was laid in Westminster on the 12th of May. At our meeting on the 5th of May, the committee received notice of an associated LCM to be brought by the minister in respect of amendments to the company's directors. Or disqualification Northern Ireland Order 2002, applying here in the North. Um, the explanatory memorandum on the bill states that in relation to here, that it is not currently possible for the conduct of former directors of dissolved companies to be investigated without first restoring the company to the register of companies, which is time consuming and costly and involves court proceedings. This measure will allow the department to investigate the conduct of former directors of dissolved companies without there being a requirement to first restore the company to the register. Um, the committee has already written to stakeholders to seek their views on the LCM and draft a report, sorry, and a draft report will be brought to committee for approval. 
An early response from ICTU has raised no objections and accepts the rationale of the legislation. And I think, Peter, you circulated that to members last week. Yes, Chair. Um, now that the, the legislation has been laid, we can look at it in more depth. Helpfully, the, the bill has a, a, a schedule that's specifically about how the impact will be felt here. Okay, thank you. So moving on then to item number nine, correspondence. Um, at page 161 of your pack, there's correspondence from the clerk to the ERA committee seeking written submissions on the PMB on climate change by the 18th of June. Um, so members are content to forward to the department to ask if there are any issues arising from the bill from the department's perspective and remit and to agree a response from the committee once this is received. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then moving on, 9.2 at page 162 of your pack, there is a copy of correspondence from the Department for Finance to the Finance Committee regarding clarification on outstanding funds to the Presbyterian Mutual Society. So members content to note. Thank you. Moving on then to 9.3 at page 165, correspondence from an individual calling for a public inquiry on COVID-19. It's understood this correspondence has been copied to all committees and MLAs. The members are content to note. Thank you, Chair. Then at 9.4, page 39 of table papers, there's correspondence from the Dairy Council inviting the committee and ERA committee to a virtual site visit to hear about the sustainability of the dairy supply chain. Um, so just wanted to ask members for their views around this. Um, and whether they would be content to schedule this as an informal visit in our usual Thursday morning slot for informal meetings. Chair, the rationale being that that's the uh, the ERA committee slot and we'd probably be going based on um, what sort of suited them. Uh, and it would be fully, fully virtual, no, no wellies required or anything like that. Um, so it, I suppose it's really a case of maybe bringing back some dates to members now. Um, around what the ERA committee is going to be able to do because they're fairly bill heavy at the minute. Yeah. So if members are content, um, we put a pin in that until we can get some dates that we're able to offer. Yep. Okay. Okay, members, that's us um, for today. Uh, item number 10 is any other business and we've had none that has been uh, notified. So unless members have anything. Nope, thank oh, you. Thank you. So item number 11 then, date, time and place of our next meeting is next Wednesday morning. Um, in room 30. Thank, Thank you very much, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland.